Okay, so we're continuing looking at subspaces. So where were we? We had said what a subspace is and given some examples. We looked at the fact that any vector space V has at least two subspaces. The set, the trivial one containing just the zero vector and the full one, which is the whole space itself. Now here we go. What are the subspaces of R2? They are, it could be R2, any straight line through the origin, or the origin. So R2 and 0, those are those examples. Those are the, the origin, just the 0 vector, and that's that. And that's a subspace of any vector spaces we proved previously. The whole thing is R2. Any other vector space has to be a straight line through the origin, this says. Explanation, well, it says you must convince yourself, okay, in this week's tutorial. Well, let's just try to do that now. So, if you... R a subspace, if you have R2, right? So I'm going to draw R2. If you have a subspace of R2, it's got some vectors in it, right? So it's got to have a zero vector. That's just the origin, okay? Then it's maybe got another vector in it, okay? Then, in addition to that vector, it must have every scalar multiple of that vector, right? Because the subspace has to be closed under scalar multiplication. So it's got the positive multiples, which stretch off like this, and it's got the negative multiples of that vector, which stretch off like that. So that's a line through the origin. OK. What if you had another vector that wasn't on that line? So maybe this vector. Then you, for a start, you would certainly have all the scalar multiples of that vector, right? But you would also have those two vectors added together, which would be this vector there, right? And you'd have all scalar multiples of that. So you'd have all of that. And you would have maybe, you'd have any vector in that first line. So for example, maybe that vector there added to any vector in that second line. So maybe this vector there. So that would be uh, that vector over there. And you'd have all the multiples of that, all scalar multiples. So all these vectors like that. And if you carry on like this, you can see that by adding up, adding these two vectors, you can get any vector in the plane. So you end up with you end up with R two. So you either have just the one straight line, or if you have another vector that's not on the straight line, you end up with the whole of R two. So these are three possibilities: just the origin, one straight line through the origin, or the whole of R two. Okay, so this maybe is a bit of a confusing way of putting it. The subspaces of R2 are R2, straight lines to the origin. No, it's, it's, it's more like any straight line. It's a single thing, right? It's any straight line through the origin, but just one. OK. The next theorem. The subspaces of R3 are, well, certainly R3. That's going to be one of them. Then there'll be the origin. Yes, that'll be one of them as well. Now, what are the other possibilities? Well, again, we could have straight lines through the origin. Of course, you could have... One vector that's going for the, one vector that's based at the origin and pointing somewhere, and then all the multiples of that would be a straight line. But now, if you take another vector, let me draw this situation. So here's R three. Here's a little sketch of R three. X axis, Y axis, Z axis. Now we suppose we have uh, we have this one vector here, and then if, we, if we're going to put this vector in a subspace, we're going to need the, we're going to have the, every vector pointing in the same direction or the opposite direction, so that whole line. Then we have another vector, like over here, pointing this way, different, not in the same line. Now, together, together, these things make a plane, right? Sort of shaped like that. A plane that contains those two vectors. Well, it contains those two vectors and all the linear, linear combinations of those two vectors. But it's not the whole of R3. It's just that plane. And the plane, of course, goes through the or origin because those vectors come from the origin. So that's a plane through the origin. Let me, again, let me change this not to planes through the origin. It's, to me, it makes more sense to say any plane through the origin. And then, of course, so you have the, any straight line through the origin. OK. It can't be a line that doesn't go through the origin 
because a line that doesn't go through the origin doesn't have the zero vector on it, and the zero vector has to be there in the subspace. Same with it can't be the plane has to go through the origin, because if the plane doesn't go through the origin, it doesn't have the zero vector on it. And so you'd have a subspace without the zero vector, which makes no sense. Okay. Let's carry on. We may have a strong intuition that these types of subspaces are fundamentally different from each other in some way. Ah, they mean that they're saying that somehow isn't R theory somehow different fundamentally from a plane from a straight line? Isn't a plane somehow fundamentally different from a straight line? Isn't a straight line fundamentally different from a point? Although we haven't yet talked about the dimension of the vector space, subspace, it seems reasonable to describe these subspaces as having dimension. These subspaces as having dimension. Three, that's R3. Two, the plane. Okay, because it's like there's two directions you can go on the plane, two independent directions. One, one direction, the line. I mean, the line is created from... Again, I'm just going to change this to plane. I mean, just to make it clear that it's not two planes or two lines. It's just one line. Any line, but just one line. So two, it's like the plane is created from two different vectors. One, the line is created from one different vector. Oh, that makes another makes a good point. That reminds me that we talked about why, in this case, this case of R3, we said, well, if you have two vectors, then that makes a plane. Okay, what if you have three vectors? Okay, so you take three vectors that don't point in the same direction. So now, and if that third vector is on the plane, okay, then it's already a linear combination of those first two vectors, so you don't get anything more than just the plane. However, if you choose a vector that is out of the plane, okay, it doesn't have to be a perpendicular to the plane, but it's just not on the plane, then it's not a linear combination of those first two vectors. It's not a combination of vectors in the plane. And now you should be able to see, if you think about it, that you can, with linear combinations of, the, of, the linear combinations of these three vectors now, you can get anything in R3. So the subspace that's bigger than the plane, the only one bigger than the plane is R3, the whole of R3. So that's why we go straight from R3 to the plane through the origin, just like you went from R2 to a straight line in that case. OK. Next thing. The null space of a matrix A is a subspace. So remember the null space, what's the different null space? The null space of A, it's all those vectors, all those vectors, such that AX equals the zero vector. That's a null space. Now, apparently this is a, this is a subspace. It says we've already actually done this in the previous section, but for the sake of completeness, let x and y be elements of the null space. Then, if you take a linear combination of them, a times that linear combination, what you get is, yes, we did, we've done this before. Now that's 0, that's 0. So you have alpha times 0 plus beta times 0, so you get 0, which means that ax plus by satisfies the homogeneous equation, this homogeneous equation. So ax plus by, alpha x plus beta y is also in the null space. So the null space is closed under linear combinations, which is a, means it's closed under vector addition and scalar multiplication. So I think so far we've been proving things are closed under vector addition and scalar multiplication separately. So, you know, we would prove that it's okay. But you can also do it in one go together with this linear, with this, uh, looking at this linear combination. Because if it's closed, closed under vector addition would mean uh, X and Y being in the space implies X plus Y being in the space, right? Closed under scalar multiplication means, whoops, means X being in the space and alpha being in the set. Oh, alpha being a scalar, sorry. Implies alpha X is in subspace. Um, but if you put those together as if x and y are in the set, then alpha x plus 
beta y is in the set, okay, if you put something like that, these two conditions are equivalent because you can you can make up this this thing in two steps. Firstly, you multiply. Let me do this. Actually, let me actually write it down. First of all, oh, I should have said here that alpha and beta are scalars. You know. So first of all, you show that you can see that alpha x and beta y are in S because it's closed under scalar multiplication. And then you say, well, alpha x plus beta y are in S because it's closed under vector addition of those now two vectors. Um, similarly, if you have, if you just have that it's closed under this linear combination, this linear, linear combinations, you can you can re retrieve this uh, the fact that it's closed under just vector addition by setting alpha equal to beta equal to one, right? And then alpha x plus beta y. So if we have x and y in S and alpha equals beta equals 1, then we know that alpha x plus beta y is in S, okay? But alpha is 1 and beta is 1, so that's actually just equal to x plus y. Similarly, you, if you let alpha equal to beta equal, oh, if you let alpha equal 1 and beta equal 0, then you get, again, you get alpha x plus beta y is in S, but alpha is 1, so that's just x, and plus 0 times y is 0, so you just have x, isn't it? Oh, not, I don't want x, I want alpha to be, sorry, if I say alpha is any real number, and beta is particularly 0, then the first term is alpha x, and the second term is just 0, which goes away, so you just have alpha x is in S. So in this way, I've shown that if you want to prove that something's closed under if you want to prove that something is a subspace, you can either prove that it's closed under scalar multiplication and a vector addition, or you can just prove that it's closed under a linear combination of two vectors like that. Okay. And that's what they've done here. They've taken a linear combination of the two vectors, like we did, we did this earlier, and you find that you still A of that is still zero, so it's still in the null space. So this uh, little line is just proving that if x x and y are in the null space, then this line is showing that alpha x plus beta y is also in the null space. So it's closed in linear combination, so it's a vector space. Uh, so it's a subspace. Okay, the last thing in this section. The set of solutions to an inhomogeneous system is not a subspace. Oh, well, we actually already looked at this, right? Early in fact, 1.10, we saw that if you take two inhomogeneous things and add them together, solution and add them together, you get you don't get another solution. So here's the little proof of it. So you have ax equals b and ay equals b. So x and x and y are solutions to the same inhomogeneous, inhomogeneous system. We're saying that we're saying that b, this b is not zero, right? Now, if you take x plus y, a of x plus y, what you get, you get ax plus a y, which is b plus b, which is 2b, which is not the same as b, if b is not 0. Okay. So the set of solutions to the homogeneous system is a subspace. The set of solutions to the inhomogeneous system is not a subspace. Okay. Now there's a final example here. And we're going back to this thing, the space of functions. Okay. Now consider the differential equation y dash equals x, y. Okay. So a solution to that differential equation is a function, right? A function of x. So it's an element of this subspace of functions, which is, this vector space of functions, which is r to the r. Okay. Let y1, ooh. Let y1 and y2 be solutions to this differential equation. Is the linear combination alpha y1 plus beta y2 also a solution? Well, you check. How do you tell if something is a solution to that equation? You just sub it into the equation. So you sub it in for, you sub in this new thing for all the y's in that equation. So you sub it in there, right? You differentiate it. Okay, differentiate it. Now, how do you differentiate a sum? You differentiate each individual part. How do you differentiate a constant times a function? You do the constant times the derivative of the function. So we have a, so we have this line, alpha y1 dash plus beta y2 dash. But we said that y1 and y2 are solutions to this equation. 
So that means that y1 dash must equal x y1. So you see, y1 dash, we change it to x y1 now. Similarly, y2 dash equals x y2. But now you can factorize out this x, and you're left with x times a y1 plus b y2. So we have a y1 plus b y2. The derivative of that equals x times itself. But that's exactly that equation, just with the new, just with y being alpha y1 plus beta y2, right? So in other words, alpha y1 plus beta y2 is a solution to this differential equation. So what we found then is that the set of solutions to this differential equation is closed under linear combinations. We found that, I mean, as long as the set isn't empty, as long as there is a solution to this differential equation, which of course there is, but we don't know that yet, we found that this set, so this set S, of all those y's that are functions, okay, such that they satisfy this differential equation, so that says all the solutions to that differential equation, that set is in fact a subspace. It's a vector space. But it's closed under vector addition, scalar multiplication, it's closed under linear combinations. And that fact applied to other equations, other differential equations as well, is why this course is called linear algebra and differential equations, why we're doing those two different subjects in the same course. Because linear algebra can be used to solve, to understand differential equations. Okay.